first of all, to say this this is an ongoing research project, so um, we haven't. There's not going to be some massive conclusion to this, but we're work, what we and Steve have been doing is looking into James Acklin and Bristolian for, well, since, certainly since Christmas, something a bit before that, uh, with the idea of actually publishing something at some point in the Radical History Group, because we feel it's a bit of history that's been, uh, well, not very well known about. And the more you look into Acklin, I think Steve would agree, like, and the Bristolian, you find what a wealth of stuff he did. Well, first of all, what a huge amount of activity he was involved in, but also what a wealth of publications. I mean, he was not this. This Bristolian paper, which I had one, an original here, you go to the Bristol Record Office or Bristol Central Reference Library and have a look at them, and they're really, really interesting things to read um, because you pick up on the style of oratory in the sort of 1820s, 1830s. But um, he certainly produced a lot of stuff. I mean, we, we're, we're waiting for it, and we're going to be at it for months yet. Yeah, months, so. Months, yeah. so do you want to press the next slide? Sure, so this is a quote from... Um, from Bulmer's Gazette of Hull from 1831, talking about James Ackland. So to such an extent did this man's agitations extend that no less than 800 special constables were sworn in to keep the peace. And, I mean, Ackland had been in Hull for literally about a month. So his impact when he entered these cities and the popular support he got was, was immense. Like, and certainly in Bristol and Hull he had major impact uh, when he arrived here. So he arrived in Bristol in 1827 and eventually went to Hull in 1831 32 We'll press the next one. So we're going to do a little bit of context in the 1820s. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit very briefly about who was James Ackland. Uh, we'll, talk about shows, we'll talk a little bit about how the Bristolian tried to avoid, avoid the Stamp Act um, or the stamp taxes and why that was important. Steve's going to talk about the Reading case, which kind of brought Ackland to sort of be basically where he entered this political stage in Bristol. And then also Steve's going to talk about the various court cases, libels and prison and stuff that happened and his battles with the corporation and the wealthy in Bristol. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about I'm going to talk a little bit about what the Bristolian was talking about and what Acton was campaigning around, which is the bread ballots and slavery. Then what happened after he left Bristol briefly and, and what happened when he went to Hull. So we're going to try and whip through this so you get a chance to have a few questions. So uh, do you want to press the next one then? Uh, right, just very quickly, I mean, I'm certainly not an expert on the 1820s, we're learning at the moment, um, but just to give you an idea, it was around sort of, the franchise was around 5% of the adult male population, this is obviously prior to the Great Reform Acts of the early 1830s, um, so we're talking about a very small section of the population can actually vote, so you know, pretty much a, lot, a large section of the middle classes and trading classes, all that are excluded, you have to sort of, significant property owners. Um, obviously you all know about rotten boroughs and the, the corruption or what they call old corruption. So these are situations, I mean the famous one is Old Sarum I think, correct me if I'm wrong, which had like, what was it, one voter and two MPs or something? Right. Something like that anyway. So there was like, you know, what, and that was partly a product of gerrymandering but it was also more to do with the fact that major cities grew very rapidly. So I think Manchester, and I see an expert on Manchester perhaps at the back, but but uh, Manchester grew from being quite a small city to being massive very quickly and so there were huge populations of, of disenfranchised working class people so there were massive disparities in certain cities. Bristol actually wasn't too bad because it had been around for quite a while so there was a kind of sort of, there hadn't been a massive influx into Bristol in the same way as some of the northern cities. So there were these big disparities which were partly gerrymandered, partly to do with the way um, the franchise worked and the, the movements of people. Um, Corporations, which were sent, corporations are, you know, I could kind of, you could kind of read them as sort of city councils effectively. I mean, people in Bristol still call them, call the council a corporation even now, which is quite interesting. But, um, you know, these corporations were, were, you know, very much in the hands of like mercantile or bourgeois classes. You know, they, they kind of functioned as, as um, a kind of political closed shops effectively. And there's certainly something that, that Ackland sort of went into went to war with. And there's a lot of, I mean, just to give an example, I mean, there's one, one interpretation of the 1831 riots in Bristol, the Great Reform Riots, was that they were actually a riot against the corporation. So, you know, there was, you know, serious sort of divisions in communities around, and certainly all class divisions around the, the running of cities. Um, I'm trying to place Ackland a little bit in this kind of Wilkes to the Chartists period. So what I'm talking about Wilkes is sort of like this kind of like, um, 
where you get the London mob, you get these sort of big popular demonstrations, often sometimes spurred on by these kind of ruling class figures who are, a bit, who are dissenting, who are perhaps pro-reform, pro-enfranchise. That's what you get in London in the sort of late 18th century. But you've also got later movement of the Chartists in the 1830s and 40s, which, is, which arguably changes the way um, political protest and political movements operate. So kind of Ackland falls into this middle period, kind of. So there's elements of Ackland which relate to things like the chart to Chartism, but there's also elements of Ackland that relate back to these sort of popular movements and popular kind of protest. Um, and these protests were, you know, that going looking backwards were often sort of very, they could be very symbolic. So it would be like, you know, people would come out on the streets, hold up, you know, whether it be a loaf of bread, I mean, you know about all this, all the experts about all this, what else do they do? Loaves of bread. Well, a loaf of bread, normally black, black cranks, black cranks sort of the de deaths, if you like, it was symbol symbolised death. So basically they put the black crank over because there's the death of the people and also the death of honest trade, if you like, you know, when, the, when the price of bread went up. You get coffins, yeah. you, yeah. get, you get people dressing up as women, you get blacking up, you get all sorts of carnivalesque sort of act. If, Parts they, of these. if they were friendly, sometimes they put someone in the carriage and unhook the horses and then drag the carriage around, and that showed that the people were, were transporting this person. You know? Yeah, so dragging people around cities yeah. in great parades. Yeah. So there's all this kind of stuff which is sort of 18, uh, you know, which to a certain extent starts to disappear in the in the 19th century and certainly into the 20th. Um, there was also a culture of, of, well, at least a culture of public meetings, and they weren't always these raucous big demonstrations, you know, people did go to public meetings, they went to like, get educated, they went to debate, and, and there was like a whole culture of oratory as well at the time, and Ackland was a, was a great orator, um, and so there's, that's kind of the culture that we're, we're talking about, but, they, but to a certain extent, Ackland and lots of other public speakers in that period actually, you know, it, it increased this, this, this kind of public debate sort of stuff, that became more and more popular in this phase. Um, and finally, there was this sort of culture of pamphlets and broadsheets, which have been around obviously for a long time. But um, we'll come on to the, to the stamp duty in a minute and how they tried to, you know, the authorities were trying to suppress uh, publications, particularly on a class basis. They were trying to stop workers, people reading lots of, of interesting political stuff at the time. So there's this, this is kind of the culture we're in. Next. Well, who was James Ackland? Well, he was born in London in 1799. He was actually the son of a well-to-do government contractor. Uh, he was pretty well schooled. He, he could speak Latin, French. He, he actually won the school elocution prize. So he was kind of an or you know oratory from a pretty young age and stuff. Um, his father went bankrupt after the end of the Napoleonic Wars. I mean, they literally lost everything. So, so Ackland was literally on his own you know, in a sense. He, had to, he didn't have that like, kind of, sort of step up after, apart from his educational background. You know, he had to go off and be be these various things, which were apparently an actor, a teacher, a shipping clerk, parliamentary police court reporter, which is very important. So in London, he was the police court reporter was. You went into the court and you actually reported on what was going on. And actually, there wasn't much reporting of police cases. I mean, they, they were quite sort of you know sort of um, somewhat groundbreaking journalism going on. So he'd done that in London. He'd not act as that, and um, and then became a journalist. Um, he'd been involved, he started to get involved again in campaigns against the newspaper taxes and, and also about the inequities or the inequalities of, of libel laws. So he was already involved in that in London when he came to Bristol in 1827. And the first thing we spotted, wasn't it, was that he, he was doing these kind of public lectures which were like educational lectures, wasn't it? So it would yeah, be how like, to learn languages, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, learning languages, but he was also quite controversial. So there was a thing called the Hamilton system, which was a new way of learning language, and it was being sold like you might see on the internet, you know, get this course, pay this money, and you'll learn Spanish in 24 hours or something. But he criticised all that, and he, was, he got into a big public debate about this Hamilton system and said it was rubbish, and there was all this rowing. So early on, you can see he's, he's going to be controversial, yeah. but even when he's just doing public sort of educational lectures. Anyway, next one. Right, I just, I put these up, so I don't know if you can see them, but these are, this is the Bristolian, which appears, right, first of all, in the first edition is in May 1827. And um, it comes out almost, at the, well, it comes out, and Steve will come on to it in a minute, but immediately causes controversy. But what's interesting about it is just to see the titles. I don't know if you can see here, but so it starts the Bristolian daily local publication on May the 28th, 1827. 
um, pretty much the, the next, the, that's number one, and this is number one, two weeks later. And this is called, not the Daily Local publication, but the Daily Literary publication. And then, you know, a week later, it's called the Daily Local and Literary Periodical. <laughs> and then it's called the Daily Literary Periodical. So what's going on here? Why is it changing its title all the time? Well, it's because of this stamp duty. So, I mean, I won't go into the history. I'm sure people know a lot more about stamp duty than me. But basically, um, the stamp duty was brought in, <laughs> arguably, to suppress publications that, quote, excite hatred and contempt to the government and the holy religion. So um, it was kind of something you had to pay. You had to put extra money on the price of the paper, so it made it less accessible to, um, you know, to, 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 to the less well-off. And also they brought in this thing called the bond, where you had to pay this huge sum of money. I think it was like 200 quid or something. It's ridiculous. So a huge amount of money, which you had to kind of place. It was a bit like getting a season ticket at Arsenal. You had to pay this, <laughs> pay this bond ahead of having the season ticket. And it was a bit like that. And they could keep that if you were playing games. or. And there was lots of rules about what you could produce. So why he's put in daily literary publications, he doesn't want to call it a newspaper. Because if you start reporting on stuff like news, that's what they really went for. So you're not allowed to actually do current affairs. And so what he always what he fronts it as is, is different. He calls it a pamphlet, for example. It's not a pamphlet, it's a broadsheet. It's exactly like this. Literally the same as that size. And, and so he calls it a pamphlet, he tries to call it a literary publication, he, he puts they put there's all sorts of tricks and games you play to try and avoid this 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 tax. And, um, and to give you an idea, it was serious. I mean, like in the 1820s to 30s, like hundreds of people went to prison, you know, for not for not being able to pay the stamp duty or being, you know, failing to pay the stamp duty and then being imprisoned. So do you want to press the next one? So it eventually became this, the Bristolian, and it's called the Memoirs and Correspondence of James Ackland, proprietor and editor, written by himself. So that's telling you something. It's like it's always just a few letters. Like, you know, it's not it's not a newspaper or anything. Um, and, uh, I, I mean, you can't see this, but this is a picture we found actually yesterday um, in the library. And it's, it's, this is a Broad Street, if you recognise it. So, it's at the Thistle Hotel, the Grand Hotel now. You know that, you recognise that thing looking down the street? Yeah, that's right. Well, the Bristolian office is just here. It says the Bristolian. And so he had an office on Broad Street. And that's where, um, that's where he had his like, paper boys delivering the paper all over the city. Um, and this is a quote, and again, we're not, we think it's realistic. <laughs> there have been a number of complaints sent to the Bristolian office concerning the antics of my Bristolian boys disturbing the quiet of the city while selling and distributing the Bristolian newspaper. They are said to be blowing their horns continually on very loudly, and on occasions blowing them under posh ladies' bonnets. So they got in trouble for that. So um, if you can make the right size, is it possible to get the right size because we're losing it? Anyway. So, uh, yeah, they. They hit, he hit the streets. There's no way this was being done as a kind of undercover operation. It wasn't like some underground newspaper at all. This was right up front. It was on the streets, blowing horns, people out, you know, all the kids out. Bristolian, they pushed it. They weren't, so they might have been playing games around the stamp acts, but they certainly weren't being trying to hide behind, you know, some seditious publication. They were up front about it. And so that, and that was that kind of style on the offensive, right from the front foot the moment he walked into a city, he didn't muck about hiding around trying to smoke your rooms, trying to organise a corresponding society or anything. So, um, next one, if that's alright, and I think, Steve. Okay, okay. Now, Ackland, being a good journalist before the days of the internet, um, had to go out and find the stories, and he was padding through Bristol one day in 1827, July 1827 to be precise, do you know the old council house, which is where the registry office is now, opposite St Nicholas Market, playing the now. He was walking past there and there was a gang of people outside the old council house and they were chatting away. And he asked them what was going on and he said, and he said there's a court case, there's a court hearing, a police court to be precise, going on inside the council house. He looked a bit, it's not their sizes, it's not the court sessions, what's going on? So he went in and sure enough there was something going on. And um, this, this, this bloke called Reddin, he was a sailor, he was being tried for smuggling. Now this is a really interesting picture, fair play to the budget of finding it and it's got the we think this might actually be a drawing by Ackland himself, and we see here a round table, and this is Bristol, I mean it looks like someone's just having dinner really, doesn't it? It's just this round table, there's a hubbub here, you can't tell who's what or such like, so there's somebody there who's obviously given out judgement, and it's got the, um, the, the, the regal sort of motif up there. When this is the actual, in London, you know, you've got the dock here, it's all quite clearly defined. Do you see the, the big difference here? You know, this is, this is where the jury sits, 
I don't know who the jury is there. And this is what Atkin found as well. He walked in there, looked around, no jury. What's going on here? Who, what's, who's doing what here? And um, he started asking a few questions. And to cut a very long story short, they didn't like the, the, his mode of questioning. So basically, Alderman Fripp Jr., who was presiding over the Reading case at the moment, tried to clear the court. He said, I've got, you know, everybody get out. And Atkin was saying, but this is, this is a court of law. This, this has got to be held in public, whilst taking copious notes, obviously. And um, Ak um, sorry, Fripp told this um, bloke called Barrel, who turned out to be a police constable, who was the clerk of the court as well, to clear the court and get Ackland out, mainly Ackland. Because Ackland had sort of come round here by now, sort of looking over Fripp's shoulder to see what he was up to. So he tried to clear him out, and he, he grabbed onto something, they couldn't get him out, and like, in, in the end, they had to continue with the hearing. And Redding, what had actually happened, he was a, 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 what was known as a tar, which is an old sailor, you know, someone who had been about a lot, I think he'd served about 30 years on, on the... On the um, 17. 17 years of sailor, yes, up there with big letters. <laughs> <laughs> he did serve 30 in the end, honestly. And um, they, they nicked him coming off, um, or coming back from seeing his sister in Cork, with a two-gallon container of whiskey. So they were doing him for smuggling, because he hadn't paid the um, excise duty on it. Now what basically they did is they, they sent this to him, they gave him five years compulsory service in His Majesty's ship. Now this, to all extents and purposes, could be a death sentence. Because if you're on the Majesty's ship, yeah, you could end up serving in the war. You know, but also, there, I mean, for those of you who do know a bit about um, naval discipline at the time, you know, there was whippings, there was um, reduction of food, etc, etc. It was a nice place to be. And Redding was absolutely distraught, you know, all he did really was got a big bundle of whiskey from his sister, coming back and all of a sudden he's facing five years. And also at the time as well, he, the, the ship that he was meant to be serving on had sailed off over the horizon, he was still, he was still on remand. So anyway, um, Ackland argued the case of Redding, as I said, that it all ended in chaos and Redding was taken away and Ackland said to him, he was taken away, he said, don't worry, I'm going to fight your corner. So a couple of days later, there was no one in these sort of higgly-biggly courts, and, and this is what Ackland was getting his teeth into, is um, the, a lot of these magistrates and from the um, corporation, because the people who served on the corporation, the aldermen, would also serve as magistrates. It was all self-serving. So they were doing all the same work, if you like, you know. But they were having lots of these little hearings behind closed doors that nobody sort of knew about, but people were getting, it seemed like, you know. So, he needed to stop this, he needed A, to publicise it, so he put um, details of the Reading case in the Bristolian, sold like hotcakes, people are going, oh, someone's, someone's heard about this, then okay, let's see what goes from this. And he says to Reading, I'm going to fight your corner. So, sorry, two, two days later, another court case, so he goes in and says, um, what about this Reading geese? Well, I want access to him. They won't let him, they won't let him see you hit him. And their, their, re their reason is, which is funny, you must have heard this at school when you asked for something, if we give it to you, everybody's going to want to go and see him. But that wasn't the actual reason. Do you know what they'd done? Is they'd whisked Redding out of jail two days later and put him on a ship in Porter's Ed called the, the HMS Racer. And they, they were about to ship him out. So like they'd had this hearing behind closed doors. Well, I forgot to say as well, no jury. This geezer had made a decision to give him five years. There was no jury. But also when, um, when Ackland fronted some of the magistrates, they said, oh, don't worry, we've written a petition. We've written a petition to the Treasury trying to get the geezer free. Now, the whole thing about a corporation is they did have the power to make their own decisions within the realms of law. So why were they writing to the bloody Treasury? We all know now what they were basically doing. They made a massive mess up and they were trying to get Reading out and forgotten. But Ackland wasn't going to let them do that. He found out where Reading was, funnily enough, from some of the sailors that were serving, said that, oh, he's, he's in Porter's Ed, they're trying to get him away from Porter's Ed. So Ackland got on the boat, bless him, and went up to Porter's Ed. And the sailors on the racer went, yeah, he's up here, in the good, mate, you know, because they were sick of it as well, you know. So he had a word with Reading, went back, cut a long story short again, the Treasury wrote back and said, free the man. So basically, Ackland went with the, with the, with the notice of freedom got on the boat and freed Reading just before he was about to get shipped away. And it was literally, apparently, it was like some one of these Hollywood spy movies where it's down to the last couple of hours, you know, they come and got him off, put him on a boat, and they went past Pill. Now, those who know Pill, it's at the mouth of, of, of the Bristol Channel and what have you, and that's where the customs house was that actually nicked him in the first place. 
And on the boat where, where Reading was now liberated, where they had a band and some other well wishes, and it was all garlands. And as Roger said earlier, you know, there was there was this symbolism of of the uh, of the spectacle, yeah. And they played, oh dear, what can the matter be, outside the customs house, which I think is absolutely superb, you know? And you picture all the customs officials thinking, oh, fuck it, <laughs> oh, God, he's still there, you know? Anyway, went down the Bristol Channel, and a little flotilla started to come in, and they were all getting around red and go, hey, and he, he's a hero. All he's done is got nicked for smuggling, fair play. You know? And he got off at Hotwells, and um, they, um, this bloke who had a carriage in there, had a taxi, a hackney taxi at the time, said, you can have my taxi for free, take him into town. And the crowd went, no horses, we we'll, we'll drag him into town, which is it's a, a big um, symbolism of like, you know, of, of this, this is our hero, you know, he's done as proud, you know, we stand with this geezer. And they pulled it, not just into town, they went down to the council house, had a little sing song, I, they, all the way around Bristol, up to Queen Square, where the mansion house was, that's where the actual mayor lives. And I'm outside there saying, oh dear, what can the matter be? And Royal Britannia and all this and freedom. And Reading was let go. And not only that, um, the citizens of Bristol raised 15 quid, which was quite a lot of money in that day, to get Reading back on it, because his ship had sailed, he'd lost his job basically. You know, so like to get him a transport to catch up with his ship so he could do his job, well, he could continue to do his job. And off Reading went. I'm afraid I don't know what happens to two gallons of whiskey, but I fear the customs <laughs> officers might have had it. Now, anybody else probably would have left it at that, done a little write-up and what have you, but Ackland, no, he, he wanted to stick the boot in a little bit, so he took an assault case up against Barrel. Remember Barrel? He was a court officer who tried to drag him out. And also against um, Fripp, or Fripp Jr., Alderman Fripp Jr. Now, the reason for this, I believe, reading in between the lines, this is, this is a bit of conjuncture here, is that he wanted, he didn't want this to go away, he wanted to show that there were these hearings going on behind closed doors and they were trying to clear the public. They didn't want you to know about it and people, well, God knows what was happening to people. I mean, this is the day also, the colonies, you know, transportation, so people could get and being sent out to work in Jamaica or Australia or God knows where on the basis of one alderman deciding it was a good idea, yeah? So he took up this assault case. The first one, you know, they, uh, there was a lot of cross-examination and such like, they, they let him speak, he said about that the actual court being cleared and how he said he had a right to be in a police court, this was a public court, and how Barrel got hold of him in the court's office and tried to drag him out, got him by the collar. And they cross-examined him and said, you know, I mean, how violent was it, and it turned out not to be that violent. And it sounds to be perfect, honestly, if Barrel was half-hearted, you know, come on, geez, and all that, and all that. And like, but they're also having to go at Fripp, because what right did Fripp have to try to clear the court? And that was, the, that was the bones of the case. But anyway, unsurprisingly, because the jury was mainly made up of people that were quite well off with the 5% that could vote, you know, so they had the same class interest as Fripp, found them not guilty. So he appealed, and um, we see here, and also at the same time he was writing all the time in here about proceedings, but it was in the Bristol Mercury and such like, but he was also saying this is in the public interest, this is about the freedom of press and the right of justice. He had his second assault case and that went pretty much the same way, you know, I think the jury deliberated for 15 minutes before they found him not guilty. But in the meantime, the corporation fought back and they started trying to do him for libel. Now this is quite interesting because basically, I spoke earlier about Azizes. Azizes was the major court in Bristol. That's where they could hang you. You know, <coughs> the court would come down and have a circuit. That'd be once a year. And there was four court sessions where the other courts, um, where the other criminal courts would be heard. This libel turned up in the court of King's Bench, which is sort of like this in-between where basically there's still a jury, but they can do it for, uh, for major misdemeanors, um, articles and for game law and such like. And his libel case was heard there. So he turns up, first day of court, he asked, well actually it wasn't the first day, he did uh, approach a court officer before and tried to get a list of the jurors because he smelt a rat. And they wouldn't give it to him, they said you only get that on um, court, uh, courts with treason, or due to treason. So he turns up at court on the first day and has a look at the jury and recognises some faces in there, to say the least. And he's there going to the judge, Justice Park, he goes, that's the son of that alderman. He's married to the daughter of that alderman. 
he actually works at the Common Council, that geezer there, and there's all these jurors up there of the people he's been libeling. Now, the, 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 the so-called libel, he, he banged to light, so he's got no hope. There was two major threads to the libel, really. There was other bits about it. They did say there was four different um, strands to the libel case, which we're going to have to do a bit more research on the other two. But the main two ones is Campion, who was an ex-mayor, brought his dog to guard his coal, his own coal scuttle, against his own workers. And he brought this big dog and brought it a collar, got it a collar <coughs> engraved or something, to let, let the dog go. And the dog took one look at Campion, didn't like him, and legged it, basically. So Campion then refused to pay the bloke who got the dog off in the first place. And the, the bloke had to take him to court to get the money back. And Acklander wrote that about this in the Bristolian. The second one is he did a list of all the magistrates. I love this bit. And like he, he sort of writes to the magistrate what they do and like, you know, what he thinks of them. Like, Golden, he was whip, wicked. Fripp is unfortunate because he's got Fripp Jr., who's vicious as his son. <laughs> George was weak. Barrow's on probation. And there was one geezer called Hayfawn. He was worthy. He was a friend of the people. And um, they, they went absolutely ballistic. I mean, some, the people who actually, you know, some of the people they were saying were vicious are in the bloody jury. <laughs> so it's, it's not going to go well for you. You can sort of see what's going on here, like, you know. So the, the case progresses, but what I found interesting, reading the, the actual newspaper reports and the court reports, is that what they're basically worried about is, is what is written is undermining the, the judicial system. They're saying, if the poor person reads this, they won't have any faith in us as magistrates. Oh shit, mate, you know? You know, if you're having meetings behind closed doors and they're shipping us off to the colonies, you know, they're, they're basically, there was nothing about whether Campion did not, not pay for this dog. There was nothing about that. There was nothing about whether any of them were wicked, stupid or irrelevant. There was none of that. It was all around him writing and undermining the corporation. And there was one bit which I thought was really interesting where they said, of course you can criticise your betters, but you do it mildly. And that's actually what um, one, one of the prosecutors, uh, uh, Sergeant Wilde, who's actual main prosecutor, said. Anyway, I forgot to say at the beginning, when, when he saw the, 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 um, the makeup of the jury as well, Ackland did say, look, you know, I could get sent to prison for several years by these people, <laughs> my mates up in the jury. Like, can, can this be heard in Gloucester? And they wouldn't change the jury and they would not send it to Gloucester. So unsurprising. Um, the judge said, right, um, the jury's there to deliberate. They didn't even have the decency to leave the room. They just looked amongst themselves and went guilty. Which speaks volumes, doesn't it? And Acton got six months hard labour. Be not sure how much hard labour he did. But it gets worse because they didn't actually bang him up straight away. Because yeah, I suppose he maybe he's a bit, they saw him as a bit middle class and such like. So they said he could go home and sort out his, out his effects. So he went home on October 27th. 1827, his, sorry, his door was hoofed in by two um, prison officers. He was in bed with his wife and his small child, and he was dragged out and taken to prison. But this is interesting as well, because when he turned up in prison, they expected him to get a really hard time, and the turnkey, the warder, and also the warden of the prison, made sure he had dinner and looked after him. And that says something as well, that, you know, people were basically on his side. And... Um, when he was committed to bribe, bribe for libel, they tried him again. He went to court again, because as I said, it was King's Bench that actually took him to the Assizes, and he ended up doing two months hard labour in Gloucester after doing a few months in um, Bridewell um, on remand. It was on remand, but they just counted against Did he stop the Bristolian? No, I was just about to say that's <laughs> a very good point, and this is why we think he sent him to Gloucester, because he was still writing the Bristolian and Nick. He wrote a thing called the King's, Be yeah. the King's Bench Gazette. Yeah, which was brilliant. It was brilliant. And it nailed it. He just nailed it week in, week out. <laughs> but also he wrote other stuff that weren't so funny, actually. I mean, a young boy at 15, he was obviously seriously ill. And they still made him work the treadmill. And he was in this really sort of cold cell and he eventually died. You know, and the thing is, is that little boy had no friends, no one came and visited him, no one really knew who he was, or even why he was there, people weren't sure. <laughs> you know. But Ackland wrote about it. He wrote about um, the diet, how people were treated, you know. And really, in, in some ways, he did a lot for um, prison reform in Bristol. It took a while, but these things do. Right, and after that, he, he came out, and there, there, was, there was a couple of other cases, but one I was really interested in was um, the Moore case. After, after this, 
The winter case, I mean, the winter case is very difficult to understand. I've really, I've got to be honest with you, I can't at the moment get my head around it because there's all these letters in the different papers and they're all talking in tongues about each other. They're even using poetry. So I'm going to have to sit down and really work out what, who's having a go at what and why. But more's a lot easier. Um, Roger's going to talk in a minute, I think, about the Bristolian Bread Association. Now, obviously, bread was a staple diet to poor people at the time. The price and also the quality of bread affected how people lived. And Ackland and several other sort of uh, well-to-do middle-class people got together and actually started producing bread that was well-made and was pretty cheap. They called it the Bristol Bread Association. And more, we've recently found out, was on the committee. Now, um, Acton gets dragged in front of the court again, and it's the same dudes on the jury, so he must have been crapping himself when he saw that. It's the same people on the jury, and for um, threatening behaviour against this more bloke, and apparently, you know, comrades, and apparently he turns up at his shop with his dog. Well, first of all, he chases him down the road, doesn't he? He's got this big dog called Lion. As you can imagine, I don't think it's going to be a chihuahua, because every time they talk about his dog, they talk about it in terms of, he brought his dog again, so I think it was a pretty big dog, you know. And he chased this geezer called Moore Rounds, and then he turned up at Moore's shop with 30 to 40 people, went in with 8 to 10. And Moore done, a, done the sensible thing, I suppose only for circumstances, legged it out the back, but left his 10-year-old son to, to answer, to Acklin and his friends. And um, Acklin was saying, where's the £1,900? So, you know, reading in between the lines once again, you know, obviously Acklin feels that Moore's had £1,900. He's also on the Bristol Bread Association um, committee list as part of the Treasury Committee. And then later on you find out, I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead of you here, but when the Bristol Bread Association um, collapses in April 31, that they talk about the £1,900 and it gets spread out amongst the dividend, the shareholders again. So it looks like more had it large with, with this money, from the, 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 but they got it back in the end by somehow. Ackland was also somebody, one of his big things was, was, was really interrogating charities. Yeah. Because he saw there was being a, yeah. a serious amount of corruption. So yeah. he, he, it was almost like his own. His, his, own, back, his own back door got kicked yeah. in, basically, on this case, very much so. And the court case was quite uh, impressive as well, because Ackland, once again, was representing himself. Now, it's gone horribly wrong before, because there were times in, um, like this Salt case, for example, he was told he couldn't be a witness and a prosecutor. Um, in the libel proceedings, they said to him, they produced a Bristolian to, say, to show what he'd done, but he wasn't allowed to produce a Bristolian because he hadn't paid the Stamp Act. So there was these double standards all the way through. And in the Moore case, it's the same thing, you know, he was only half allowed to represent himself, but he was allowed to cross-examine Moore. And um, it turns out that Moore had had this money away, blah, blah, blah. Also, a lot of other people were called as well and um, on Ackland's side and said, that didn't happen in the shop, it wasn't like that. Two people went in, politely asked or whatever, Moore's telling lies. But they still found against him. And once again, it was unanimous. It took him about 10 minutes. And he had to pay £20 sureties against his good behaviour. So whilst Moore had 1,900 away from the Bristol Bread Association, actually had to pay £20 not to bother him anymore. This speaks volumes. But um, I think that's all on the court cases. And I'll hand back over to Roger. Thank you very much. Very good to see you. Right, um, I just want to go through some of the other things that Acklin was doing at the Bristolian. Um, so we talked a little bit about the Bristol Bread Association, but I just want to read, read a little um, description of a Bread Association demonstration. So uh, this, was, uh, this was in December 1829, and um, so it's just a description of what of one of these... So Brandon Hill is quite important in all this. If you don't know about Brandon Hill, Brandon Hill was the People's Hill. It was a you know, centre of kind of popular protest but also you know people just went up there and crowds a lot so it was a very popular place um, it's been completely um, invaded and taken over by the Clifton ruling class now but anyway so um, but it was it was the place everybody met because you could see the whole of, of the city so anyway Ackland with his penchant for theatrical display and abundant ego was in tune with an old-fashioned plebeian politics and delighted in mischievous pranks his love of spectacle is evident in an elaborate stunt that took place in December 1829 to highlight the pure, unadulterated bread produced by the Bristolian Bread Association. Ackland, who just happened to be the president and founder of the association, led ten musicians, a large number of supporters and an oversized loaf of bread described as almost eight feet in length to the top of Brandon Hill. At the summit, he made a long speech before performing a mock christening ceremony upon the loaf. 
The procession then braved the treacherous snowy descent, December, and paraded the principal streets of Bristol, stopping outside the homes and businesses of Ackland's political opponents to distribute snowballs and musical insults. <laughs> At the home of Roger Moore, for example, the procession paused while the musicians struck up the tune, Go to the Devil and Shake Yourself. Finally, this is a bit like rough music. Yeah, right? it is rough. You know what rough music is. Finally, the bedraggled loaf, in a gesture which emphasised Ackland's enduring sympathy for prisoners, was donated to debtors held in Bristol jail. The progress of the monster loaf with its decorations of holly, laurel and blue and white ribbons was subsequently reported at great length in the Bristolian. So that's the kind of thing, they, it wasn't just this writing and you know, contesting the courts and all that. Was, he had a mass public support. Um, and I'm just going to, we found these two in the Bath Chronicle. Yeah, we're we were laughing a lot the other night. I mean, hopefully I can read it. But this is, this is another, another mass meeting in July 1829. So, why, why, why I'm going to highlight these things is, is that you know they, they didn't like Ackland anyway, obviously, because he was criticising the corporation, the wealthy, the merchants. But what they seriously didn't like was the fact that he was getting massive popular support. So this is a description for the Bath Chronicle. You've got to remember they're, they're, they're a bit cynical about this. It wasn't even reported in the Bristol Press that we can find. No, meeting on Brandon Hill. So this is the Bath Chronicle. <laughs> a meeting of ratepayers was convened yesterday evening on Brandon Hill by the patriotic Mr James Ackland to take into consideration some parish grievances when about 5,000 ragtag and bobtail of Bristol turned out. Mr Ackland, when he came to the ground, had great difficulty in finding a chairman who could read. And after... S Rape has? It's not, is it? <laughs> he couldn't find someone to read, anyone to read. But after some delay, a man in a fustian jacket volunteered himself to fill the post of honour and was gladly accepted. So this geezer was pulled out of the crowd. This geezer sent home for his Sunday clothes and exchanged his habiliments in the presence of the meeting. So he sent the <laughs> kiddie off to get his Sunday best. Came back, put it on. On the stage, was it? On the he's stage, got yeah. Stage, got dressed yeah. on the stage. <laughs> um, and so he, got, he put his clothes on in the presence of the meeting. This done, Mr Ackland commenced a, f a flaming and inflammatory address in which he was not sparing of the epithets felons, liars, etc. to the various of the good people of Bristol, not as so liberal-minded as himself. The speech finished, the, re the resolutions were to be read when it proved that the worthy chairman, though elected chiefly from his presumed literary attainments, could scarcely read. And the auditory, the audience, were kind enough in order to save trouble to desire him to say hard word when they reached any more than three syllables. <laughs> <laughs> so he's really the thing, I go, oh, I can't read that. They go, hard word! <laughs> <laughs> Let's carry on anyway. <laughs> in, this manner, in this manner, the thing was accomplished, and Mr. Ackland, having moved, uh, and seconded the thanks of the meeting to himself and the chairman, for he was the only spokesperson, the assembly separated. The people took the horses out of the coach and dragged the orator Ackland and the chairman through the principal streets of Bristol to his, uh, to his own home, cheering him as they went. The proceedings afforded the highest gratification to the meeting, as a proof of which we only need quote the observations of one member of the assembly, a lady, who exclaimed with great an animation, it's as good as a fight. <laughs> so that's just a description. <laughs> But, and, just, and then, a few months later, just one more, is meeting, on Brand, meeting of ratepayers on Brandon Hill. Why do they keep saying ratepayers? I mean, it's clearly not, is it? Like, at half past one yesterday, there was an assemblage of nearly a thousand people composed of the very dregs of the populace. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Ackland made his appearance in a hackney coach, accompanied by his dog, Lion, and surrounded by upwards of 20 ragged boys blowing horns. After saluting the mob, he looked around him for a chairman, his former officer having quitted the faction, when after several ineffectual attempts to induce the person to take the high station, a poor man dressed as a collier in a white woolen jacket, covered with filth and tar, stepped forward and was immediately installed by the Crown. Ackland designated him an honest, unsophisticated and ill-dressed chairman. <laughs> he gave... He, the pit, yeah. he, gave, he gave the name of Robert Venn. Ackland then addressed the mob in a strain of mingled sarcasm and complaint. He wished to defend his character from the aspersions that had been lately thrown upon him by some of his ci devant companions. He first produced the certificate of his marriage. He then cast reflections on other persons and their wives. 
and told the auditors that he, Ackland, was an honest man, whatever they might have heard to the contrary, and that he ought to place confidence in him. Money, said Mr Ackland, is the very sinews of law as well as war, and money we must have or we shall not be able to pursue justice. He then, sounds like Bristolian meeting, doesn't it? <laughs> he, he then, after calling himself the most loyal man in Bristol, advised his hearers not to pay the rates levied by the commissioners of pitching and paving. He concluded each speech by moving a resolution and then read it for his chairman, who, notwithstanding the march of intellect, had never, it appeared, been initiated into the occult mysteries of the alphabet. The chief topic of the ranks was on the perversion of justice by the judges, magistrates and juries of Bristol, all of which he alike condemned for not acting as he wished them, and also on the necessity of every person subscribing their cash for, the, for lawful purposes. When the farce was over, some of the rabble drew him through the city again. Even Ackland appeared ashamed of the figure he cut by the side of his two friends, the collier and the dog lion. And at the top of Park Street, he persuaded the late chairman to descend from the vehicle and was then drawn through all the principal streets of the city. So he's getting a lot of support. Right? And very visual. Okay, okay, right. right, next bit. So, slavery. So, 1830 is a very famous moment in Bristol because it's, uh, it's called the slavery election. That's what it's called at the time. And what you've got in 1830 is the fact that you've got these the, the kind of abolitionists taking on the West India merchants. So, the West India merchants are not divided politically necessarily, they're Whigs and Tories. So basically you end up with these two candidates, well two candidates for the pro-slavery position, because slavery actually gets abolished in 1833, so it's a really critical moment. So you've got Bailey, who's a Whig, and Hart Davis, who's a Tory, sort of in the kind of West India interest, and then you've got Acklin and Prothero standing against slavery. But the point about Acklin is, if you actually read what they're saying in the Bristolian, there's all, what this is all about is the fact that the slavery lobby realising that they are in trouble now and that they're going to lose. You know, they're basically going to lose. So what they're trying to do is try and stop slavery you know, being abolished. And so they say things like, one of the suggestions they made, that they should be given a hundred years to abolish <laughs> slavery because it might, you know, damage their interests or something. Obviously, in the end, they got paid 20 million quid, about the same amount of money that was paid to bail out the banks, equivalent amount in the end. But anyway, so the argument's all about that. Now, Ackland, when you, when you read the Bristolian, what they're, his, they're, saying, they're much more radical than Brothero even. So they're saying, absolute now, immediate freedom now for all people. You know, if you read the Bristolian, it's great to read this stuff. But I will say that Ackland was not somebody who was usually engaged in violence, right? Um, he didn't, you know, he didn't really believe in, in the use of violence. He wasn't like in necessarily, you know, kind of physical force type person. But, but that didn't mean this election was extremely violent. So, you know, basically this, the Bush Hotel was like kind of the headquarters for Prothero and the Rummer was the Bailey's, and the Bailey's sort of headquarters. And between them there were gangs being hired and there was lots of fighting. You know, they, for example, they hired sailors to go and beat up the abolitionists, and it was really quite violent all the way through. All elections in certainly that period around slavery were very violent in Bristol. There was one in 1815, I think. So, um, so this is very violent. This is this is a, a just very quickly is a letter that was sent in. Now, the the the, ba the main organizer of the gangs who were, who were pro-slavery was a guy called Christopher Claxton. So he was kind of the enforcer for the for the pro-slavery lobby. And Claxton basically wrote to the Bristolian and invited Ackland and all of his supporters to come to a meeting, right? you know, come to this meeting. And what that, what that was really was saying was, you come to this meeting, we're going to beat the hell out of you, right? we're going to attack you. So he writes a letter to Bristolian and Ackland replied with the following, let Mr Claxton and all his forces try once, uh, try, try once more to put down public opinion and they, as soon as they will, they shall be met and beaten as they were yesterday. Let the gentlemen of the West India trade, if they think it consistent with their characters, to follow the example of Mr Cunningham and, and uh, bully the friends of emancipation as they enter the commercial rooms. Let them go mad as we, with vexation if they can't help it, but let them not expect to extort our approval of, of cruelty, heartlessness and unmanly persecution that is slavery. The people are aroused in a sense of justice by the home proceedings of the enemies of humanity nor will they be put down by a few noisy dealers in slaves and sugar. And what, that, why that is such an insult, that last line, is he's drawing attention to this new bourgeois class who have basically turned themselves into this kind of gentleman. And he says, no, you're just a bunch of street traders, because that's pretty much where they came from. That's right. Originally, they were these small traders. So he's basically saying, you know, you think you're high and mighty, but you're not. You're just a bunch of street traders, and you just made a fortune, you think you can run the city now. So, 
there's no question about their attitude to slavery. Obviously, in 1830 as well, we, the political period 1830 to 1834 is extremely rocky, and you know some people argue it's a revolutionary moment in, in the 19th century. But obviously, enfranchisement, political unions are really big, very much important on the agenda. Political unions being formed in the, the first few months of the 1830s. Now. Um, Immediately, Ackland called for the formation of a political union based on the same, the one in Birmingham. And if you think, if you've not heard of political unions before, they were extremely important. So, for example, in Birmingham, they could put 100,000 people on the streets in 1830 for, to get the vote to fight for enfranchisement. So, Ackland was behind trying to form a political union in Bristol. Um, he wasn't, though, somebody who believed in the French revolutionary model. He supported the French Revolution. But he didn't believe in the, violent, the use of violence, so he, he wouldn't call himself a violent revolutionist. So, you know, he was on this reform side, but that reform side was very much aided by the threat of revolution in that period, that eventually led through this whole process to, 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 to the first stages of enfranchisement. Um, and he leaves, interestingly, before this happens in 1831, but I would argue that Ackland certainly had a major part to play in the kind of political atmosphere uh, that led eventually to the 1831 riots, or arguably the Reform Act riots. If you just click the next one, there's a couple of examples here. So this, this is just a couple of things out of the Bristolian are very interesting. So this is actually a memorial put in in October 1829, which remembers the Bristol Bridge Massacre of 1793. So it says, the memory of those helpless victims who, by, because of obstinate pride and savage ferocity, you know, where we're basically gunned down on the bridge in Bristol. So he's actually, this is interesting history. He's bringing up, you know, this is what, 40 years ago. Yeah, or they want to forget it as well. But they want to forget it. And he's bringing this up and making it very clear. And he says at the bottom here, you know, that, that basically you need to remember this because otherwise, you know, we will slip back into that kind of tyranny again. So if you don't know about the Bristol Bridge Massacre, then Steve will tell you afterwards. But it was a, a moment where perhaps riot in Bristol turned into serious violence. They, they tolerated riot to a certain extent, but then after the French Revolution, they start shooting people. So, and then here is the original advert for the Bristol Political Union as well in 1830. Do you want to press the next one? A um, couple of very interesting things, and this is, relates to all political activists. So these papers, the Bristolia, the Discoverer, the Protector, right, all start appearing in this period. And these are Ackland's enemies. So they, it's a great compliment to what Ackland did, because they're, he's, they're actually mirroring the Bristolian here. They're creating papers to attack Ackland that look like the Bristolian. And the next one. And these are some papers on the other side. After Ackland leaves Bristol, you start to see these papers appearing. The Retaliator, the Free Reporter, the Friend of the People. So this is, it explodes on the streets. Like, you know, you know this kind of I don't know, popular broadsheet you know, after, after Ackland's left Bristol. And again. Right, last bit and we'll finish. Um, so where does, where does Ackland go? Well, he's threatened again at the end. I mean, he's yeah. done some time already. He's, been, he's done under the Stamp Act. He's been put in prison for six months. You know, he's a marked man. So he moves to Hull. And this is a description of... Um, this is a picture, actually, of his first... Literally, his first couple of months he was in Hull, what he did was, first of all, he set up a, a brand new ferry service with the people because it was all being... It was, a high, you know, it was like a transport system that was highly overpriced. Does that make any sense in this city? So what, what Ackland did was he set up his own transport system with all the people in Hull to kind of get around all the taxation and all the fact that they were being robbed. This is also something he did where they tried to stop market tolls, huge crowd stuff. That's actually Ackland on the stage at the back there, if you can see it. Um, but this is a description of, of James Ackland entering into Hull in 1831. About the middle of the year 1831, the celebrated agitator James Ackland came to reside at Hull and soon distinguished himself and for three years kept the townspeople in a state of turmoil. He attacked every individual member of the corporation. The bakers were charged with adulteration. The court of requests, the Barton Ferry, the Trinity House and all the other local charities were severely handled and he subsequently commenced a crusade against the market tolls. To such an extent did this man's agitations extend that no less than 800 special constables were sworn in to keep the peace. He was a hero of 100 fights in the law courts and was frequently in prison for libel. He actually went down five times, five didn't he? Um, on one occasion, he was met by 20,000 persons who paraded the town with bands and banners. After varying fortunes, he left the town. His stormy life was ended in 1876 at the age of 72, in which time he played many parts 
Roles, his roles included those of player, author, editor, Methodist preacher, reporter, election agent, prisoner, and it is even said beggar. So do you want to press one more? So that's the end. And one, one person writing about him, quoting him, said that you know, basically he styled himself as fighting for the poor against the rich and the weak against the powerful. And so, anyway, there's more to be done. And the last picture is... So it's not over yet, is it? Like, so, so this is volume four, anyway. But there you go. Thank you. Thank you.